Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of the Pan of Sessions. I am your moderator, former intern, current account coordinator, Jordan Julio. Uh, today, I'm joined by CMS All-Star Matt Larrabee and SEO superstar Mel Coleman. And we're just going to be chatting about some common questions on websites and SEOs and uh, how they integrate together, along with some common misconceptions. Uh, but before we get into that, and without further ado, I want to give the floor to Mel and Matt to do some introductions. Matt? Yeah, that was a spiffy intro. I like it. I am uh, Matt Larrabee. I'm the web development manager at Panos. Um, I've been here 13 years, so a good chunk of my life. Um, <laughs> but uh, and yeah, I do I do all things websites. So um, really, from the ground up, building uh, the front end build, the back end build, and and everything in between. Yeah, good chunk of your life. That's a great way to kind of <laughs> describe that. Um, and yeah, I'm Mel Coleman. I'm the manager of media and strategy for Panos. Uh, so I do all things uh, paid, organic, digital, traditional media. Um, and SEO is one of my favorite, one, I don't want to say pastimes, but it's one of my favorite things uh, to get involved with because unlike paid, it's, it's not as straightforward. There is more of an art to it. Um, obviously, very much science and data driven. So that's what's really fun and challenging about it. Absolutely. Yeah. 13 years, Matt. 13 years ago, I was in elementary school. So you have quite <laughs> the, uh, the background. So that's great. Uh, but yeah, you're just getting right into it. First question I have is how often should you redo your website uh, and why? And what even goes into that uh, decision making process uh, for a financial institution? Yeah, I, I mean, I can start with that. If, definitely if you Google when I should do, redo my website, you'll see like two to three years. Um, and that's really because that's that's the life cycle of technology on the web. So if you create a website, you don't really touch it for three years, um, your competitors are gonna be doing laps around you just because technology has changed so much in that three years. We build websites completely different from year to year just because of the technology changes. Um, so that's what Google will give you, but in real life, um, there's a better question to ask, and, and that's how your website is performing. Um, so your website really can be fresh, a newborn babe right out of the box, and it can be performing terribly, not leading to any conversions, not taking advantage of, of what a website can do. Um, or it can be three years and, and still um, running well, doing what you need it to do. Um, so it's really more of a question of, of how it's performing and, and what's out there that you can do. Yeah, and I love that too. Thank you for touching on conversions because I think, you know, a big um, hurdle that financial institutions in general and that's of all sizes have to get over is that their website is not a checkbox. It's not like, okay, I have it and I'm done and it's going to do all the things. It, it needs to be built for the external audience and that external audience's needs and demands of websites change so frequently. Uh, largely what they expect is driven by what retailers in the space are doing. So blame Amazon for all of our problems, um, though I love it and always have a full shopping cart. They are the reason that we do have to redo and revisit our websites constantly because they are forever increasing the benchmarks and the consumer expectations of what they can expect online. Right. And all of it, just having that forethought as a financial institution to be like, look at where you are now and where you want to be moving forward. Um, because competition can make or break you, especially with something as complex, but something that's so universally used as a website. Um, that actually parlays me perfectly into my second question, which is what are some things to consider when choosing a CMS, uh, especially one for the long term? Yeah, and that's a super important question because you can really shoot yourself in the foot if you if you go with a CMS that doesn't have the capabilities that not that you need right now, but that you're going to need in the next three to five years. Um, so that's really what you have to think about when when picking a CMS is not where your company is is at right now, like what are you doing right now, but how you want to grow and what you want to be doing in a few years. Um, so right now you might not be doing any marketing automation. You might not be doing any personalization or really you even using data at all on your website. Um, but if you want to grow in the next few years, if you want to get into that, you need to start thinking about the CMS now and start preparing for, for those steps um, up front. 
you stole my thunder. Yeah. Um, so thank you, thank you, Matt. But yeah, I mean, again, this goes back to it too. Is uh, we, and we run into this a lot. I would say, Matt, where people are like, "Oh no, I just need a simple WordPress site right now because we're just trying to get through X, Y, Z, and we just know our old site isn't great right now, so we just want something a little new." And it's like this is the opportunity for you to revisit what your plans are as an institution moving forward because this is a growth vehicle for you whether or not you choose to view it that way that's what it is um especially in this kind of new hybrid world where everyone is you know a, some kind of a blend of remote um, or in person it means that your community is no longer geographically defined so how are you reaching and engaging people as they leave that geographic footprint that'll really dictate and be dependent upon the cms capabilities you choose when you're doing that website project um, and Matt, I just need you to explain real quick. We've had a few conversations where um, some institutions don't think they need a CMS. So can you just explain why a CMS is needed? Yeah, definitely. I, I, to me, it's almost a little comical when, when institutions say that um, just because CMSs have been around for so long and it's, it's really been a while since um, really non-CMS or static sites have even been around in the industry um, but there's really so many benefits of a cms um, for one if you're a bank it's going to offer a lot of compliance um, needs that you have so a version history um, a published queue and like workflow um, uh, things like that um, definitely like being able to track all the actions on the site uh, who logs in whatever gets updated um, but also using that data that we're talking about, a static site's not going to be able to use uh, really any of that data. Um, and then also just like ease of use. Um, so if you have team members on your site and maybe there's somebody who's um, a, a mortgage lender, but also a commercial lender and you want them in two groups, uh, with a CMS, you'd only update those in one spot. They'd update throughout the whole site. You're not going to have to find it uh, in each page of a static website and make updates. And just from experience, I mean, uh, I've been making websites for 20 plus years. I won't date myself too much, but um, back in those days when it, it was static websites, it was such a hassle to manage, um, especially larger sites when there's a lot of updates, it just gets overwhelming really quickly. And I would have to say too, from a, a staffing perspective, a lot of our uh, the institutions that we work with are always saying, hey, we have a really small team. Well, if you know that it's, you know, your C-suite or your board is always nickel and diming the mortgage team, or sorry, the mortgage team, the, the marketing team, uh, you want to see a mess that's intuitive. That that could be a WYSIWYG editor, or is what you see is what you get, where it's similar to like a word functionality where you know what you can bold and what your headline options are. If it's all kind of laid out for you, you can feel more comp uh, confident to own it and not have to always outsource if you don't have a developer or a programmer on staff. Um, so, I mean, that's not even from the security standpoint, from, from all of the kind of record keeping that you'll need to do for FDIC audits. Um, but just from a staffing perspective, if you're not ready to take a developer on in-house or pay for a freelancer or an agency, you need to make sure that the CMS you choose uh, is something that you can manage at your, you know, your kind of expertise level. Right. And a lot of it, I mean, the future of marketing is data driven and having something where you can track that data on your site is uh, it's going to put you at such an immense advantage as a financial institution. Um, and there's a legitimate argument that data is the new oil. Uh, and so if you track that data and you have it, that's just going to see your return on investment go to the moon uh, for the most part, because it's going to help you figure out where you are, where you want to be. Uh, it helps you to develop strategy um, and, you know, just keep moving ahead against your competitors, which is whatever EFI wants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Mel, I'm going to ask a question and please don't get mad. Uh, but what do I really need to do for SEO? And does it even really matter? I, I won't get mad. Maybe. Um, no, so I mean, SEO is something that has been, I mean, if you have been in marketing in any capacity for the past 20 something years, you've heard about SEO. Um, and there was a period of time and there's always kind of the inflammatory articles like is SEO dead? Uh, for as long as there is going to be search engines, SEO will be a thing. So, uh, and know that search engines, if you follow Google, uh, if you follow the updates that they make, they make algorithm updates to search every single day. They make major ones a few times a year, and then they make massive shifts 
a few every few years. And all of these directly impact the amount of traffic and the amount of conversions that you get to your site. We do know not quite definitively, but I'm, you know, I'll stake my career on it. That you're going to get about 80% of your uh, traffic to not just organically to your site, but also the conversions. That's people who are choosing to become a member, a customer that, you know, they want to engage with you. They want to hear from a lender. Now, 80% of those people are going to come from organic search. That's not just on Google, but that's also on Bing. That's on Yahoo. That's on DuckDuckGo. That's people typing into Chrome, um, you know, www.xyzbank.com. And that's really due to the brand strength that only happens when people have exposure to you. So SEO will never be dead. In fact, it's never been more complex. Um, thank you, Google, again, uh, for that. And that's really because there's so many components to it. We tend to liken it to a car where you can buy a car, just like if you've launched a site and you've built it to the latest and greatest standards. You've done all of the right things. So your car is working great. Everything's awesome. You drive it off the lot. It's already depreciated in value. And that's because the moment you launch it, things are already changing. So what is your plan in the next month? And that's not just saying like, technically you can be fine for a little bit, you know, for, for the most part, technical standards don't change drastically from day to day. The difference is, is that technical standards need to be kept up with same with like an oil change, changing your brake pads. Cause are you uploading images? To the right size are the are all of those optimized every time you upload an image do you have alt text or meta descriptions whenever you're uploading content again what are those back end data points that you're using to make sure that search engines know exactly what's on your site um, is that content written for the external user are you answering questions for gen z and gen y are you still focused on talking to the what you're considering the core probably of your entire customer base which is likely around 50 plus 50 years old or older. Um, and that's really where we start to talk about what are your growth goals over the next five, five years? And that's going to be appealing to Gen Z, Gen Y, which means that you have to change the way that you talk. And that happens on your website because these two generations are the most knowledgeable, the most educated, um, and the least likely to trust you at your word. They are going to research to the nth degree. They're gonna look at all of your competitors. They're gonna see what everyone in this space is saying. So if you're not saying anything, and if you haven't touched content since you drove that car off the lot, you're behind and people aren't going to trust you just because you have this institutional, hey, we're a bank. That's not going to fly anymore. So that's really where uh, the car metaphor tends to make the most sense, because if you don't keep up with these things, your new car can really become um, kind of a lemon pretty quick. Right. And, you know, as the unofficial spokesperson for Gen Z at Panos, uh, you're right with saying that there is a ton of pressure on financial institutions to reach users and audiences, especially the future, which is my generation. And, you know, you could have all, you know, X, Y, and Z, all this great things. But if you're not currently going to evolve and evolve and evolve, we're just going to move on because, you know, I hate to say it, but a lot of loyalty and is just not there as it used to be. Um, but as community banks and financial institutions, you know, reach out and get there that they can hold on to our gener my generation and then their generation after that and after that. So that's something we want to keep in mind. Um, yeah, Didn't no, like how fun. quickly you excluded me from your generation. Me and Matt are both sitting here like, that's okay. I'm sitting right well, here. Yeah. You. Um, You're right. <laughs> <laughs> <You're basically. But> yeah. <laughs> it's true. I mean, and you know, I focus a lot on content because technical stuff for like, I mean, is easier than content. And that's because technical is you can go in, you know how to update the classes, you know how to, it takes time, but content is more of an enigma. What do you think your users need to know? There's research that needs to happen. You need to be looking at what the trends are. You need to also look at where that content should be going what form it should take. It's not just a 300 word blog up on your site anymore, like get in front of a camera um, and then turn that into a, a quick blog too. So there's a lot of different components here, but content is really gonna be the primary driver. It can't go anywhere if the technical things are all completely out of whack, then you've just got, you know, nice leather interior with no wheels on a car. So um, you, you really need to make sure that structurally everything's in place, but then you have to have content to make it go. 
Right. Um, and parlaying this to Matt, how do we set up that architecture to house all this functionality and content in the CMS? And what are some things that uh, financial institutions should be thinking about consistently? Definitely data is really the first thing you want to think about. So, I mean, a rule of marketing is if you get the right content and learn from the right people, you're going to have conversions. Um, so kind of in the old days of, of websites, um, you had to really pick your audience. Um, you had to pick who you were going for. And there's still some of that today. But with things like personalization and marketing automation, um, that's really changed. So you can really speak to a lot of different audiences where they are on your website now instead of just reaching one audience. So kind of the best example of that is maybe personalization on a site with voice stages. Um, so maybe you're reaching out to um, Gen Zs or, or younger people with uh, education. Um, we all know when you're first out of school, you probably don't know much about financing. Um, you're going to want that education. Maybe also savings, checking CDs, some of that um, early on investing and, and things like that. So you're going to be able to track who's coming to your site and by their actions, you're going to be able to group them into this category. Um, so then you can offer them specific content just for them, specific education uh, just for millennials. Or, or maybe if we get into other life stages, we have um, a young family where you can gear it toward first time home buyers and people who are just starting to think about maybe retirement or saving up for some of those bigger purchases in life. Um, and then you can move on to another life stage like retirement, offer them wealth management and invest investments and retirement um, options there. So really, it was really hard to do that um, with an old website and market to all three of those at the same time. Now with personalization and, and data, um, you can really capture who a user is and make the site personalized for specifically for them. And so um, I love to give an example kind of in real life. Maybe if you have a friend um, and you have a conversation with them you're, and they're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to my, my grandma's 100th birthday this weekend on Saturday. Um, any real person um, is got to keep track of that data that they have on that person. So they're not going to go the next day and say like, oh, hey, can you babysit my kids on Saturday? That's going to be offensive and <laughs> it kind of off putting. And that's how people are on the web these days, too. So um, if you're if they show interest in a first time in, in a mortgage, a first time home own, homeowner mortgage, and then they come back to the website and you offer them retirement, they're going to get they're going to get a bad sense about that. They're, they're not going to love that, especially the younger generation who's used to um, you tracking and knowing them a little better. Um, so a little rambling, but really that's that's where you need to think these days. You need to take advantage of this data that's out there. I love that example, though, because that really like that's like the best example of personalization. That was kind of a weird example. I just made it. Good. I really <laughs> like it, though. I really like it. Yeah. Uh, because it's so true, uh, you know, like going back to Amazon, who, who really, I think, uh, did this really, really well at scale, which is where, you know, you you log in and same with like Xfinity or Google, like you never log out because you're never going to remember that password. So you just stay in. Um, but they greet you with like a, hey, Mel, like check out the things that we have new today. And they're all going to be things based on your search history. And that's what we all want to see. So the challenge really for uh, digital marketers, just myself, um, is that, you know, we're, we're entering into a cookie-less world that'll be happening really in 2022. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a battle that's happening. There's a, a massive discussion around how do we continue personalization without the cookie? And a cookie, um, despite being delicious things in real life, are um, just snippets of code that allow to allow us to determine where users go and what they're doing. That sounds creepy. It can be some some users, you know, some advertisers did not do well with it. But by and large, it's given us all the creature comforts of what personalization is. It's the reason that uh, you know you don't see um, to Matt's point. Like I'm I'm not going to see retirement things or retirement homes or AARP ads, uh, but I am going to see landscaping and um, you know 
how to engage your toddlers, things that really make sense to me, but that's based off of cookies. So the challenge for, for banks in particular is that we have not been very good at capturing first party data and first party cookies are going to be fine. It's really what do you do and how do you engage with sites or with users who come to your site? Whenever they engage with you directly, that's first party because that's you. Um, and this comes back to then what CMS do you have to be able to do that personalization with them? Because that depending upon the CMS you have, you'll be able to remarket to them and to personalize within your site to do cross it like more intuitive cross selling um, anything to deepen the share of wallet as we know banking is much more of a service than product driven which is a little bit of a change from what we've seen in the past um, so how as a service do we continue to expand the relationship and i think that personalization is going to be a really critical driver of that especially with younger generations 100 percent agree uh, that's a great great description by both you mel and matt uh, but you know, my next question really is, so I've done all this. I, I you know I've put the content out, uh, I've done everything I feel, but I'm still not showing up on page one on Google or Bing or DuckDuckGo. Uh, you know, how does a website's content it really help me, you know, bypass my competitors and become one, two, or just on the first page in general? Oof. This question. <laughs> um, the the thing about being on page one. Even being above the fold, being in the in the coveted number one position on page one of search um, is that Jordan, Matt and myself could be sitting in the literal same room, same Wi-Fi network, same location, all of the same things. We could be using the same device. We could search or the similar device. We could all search for the exact same thing and we would get three different search result pages. And that's contingent upon the fact that Google knows search is built for the end user. So just because I'm really interested in knowing what the best schools are near me as my kids are entering in kindergarten, Jordan does not want to see that. He does not. So right. Google wants Jordan to continue to trust Google. So Google is going to show Jordan things that make sense for him, even if it's the same searches. So even if we were to say, hey, best coffee shops near me, Google would know that I'm a Duncan fanatic. So they're going to show me primarily likely Duncan sources. Jordan may be Duncan also has a you know very high rating. It's very trustworthy. They're the largest, but um, he may also see you know the one that he tends to frequent, and maybe that's like some kind of a local coffee shop. Right. He may see that based off of his behavior, and I think that that's always the disconnect. Is just because you're doing the right things, know that you are competing with every other bank in the space. So how are you going to differentiate? And that's really comes down to the quality of your content, not just checking a box and saying, yeah, I answered this question but truly what are you trying to achieve with that content? And you don't have to be on page one to be found. So that's where there's a whole other backlinking structure and it's trying to make sure that that content is pushed onto other mediums that are a little bit less competitive um, outside of search. Right, well, uh, that's all the questions I had today. Um, I thank you to Matt and Mel for joining us. Um, and if you'd like to reach out, uh, the emails are, my email is j j u l i o at panelsmarketing.com. Um, and then Mel M. Coleman at panelsmarketing.com. And then Matt Larrabee, uh, M. Larrabee at panelsmarketing.com. Uh, thank you everyone and have a good day.